Welcome everyone to another Blender 2.8 tutorial. In this one I'm going to be showing you how to track deformable objects, which is something I'm very excited about because I have not seen a single tutorial about this on YouTube. So as far as I know, we are going into new waters. So here is the footage that I recorded with my phone. You see I have a piece of paper that I'm bending, and hence this is a deformable object. We have a bunch of tracker markers here. And our goal is to bring this into Blender and somehow track this and have kind of like a 3D representation of this that bends with the paper. So how are we going to do this? Well, before we even hop into Blender, the first thing we need to do is take care of this footage. Well, what do I mean? When we go into Properties, and by the way, everything including this video and the scene files is going to be available in a download link in the description. But uh, when we go into the Properties of this video, you're going to notice that it is 29.91 frames per second, which is very, very inconvenient and is a fairly strange frame rate. And again, this is because I recorded it with my phone. So what we want to do is take this and turn it into an image sequence because Blender sometimes freaks out when you give it weird frame rates and we don't want anything to desync. So before we go into Blender, let's just make a new project folder. We can call it Paper Tracking. And then inside of here, we need to make a folder for where we want our sequence. So we'll call this sequence. And now we are ready to get started. So let's open up Blender. There we go. And we can delete everything to begin with. So A, X, delete. Uh, keyboard shortcuts are going to be up here. So first thing we need to do is import our footage and turn it into an image sequence. So to do this, I'm going to go from 3D uh, viewport over to movie clip editor. I'm going to click open for import and then I'm just going to navigate to the footage. Okay, so our footage is now open. One thing you may notice is that it is 259 frames. However, Blender default scenes have 250 frames. So to go from 259 to 250, you either type in 259 or you click this button right here. And what that does is it automatically does it for us, which is very convenient. Okay, cool. If you now go to output, which is where we can set our frame rate, you're going to see a whole bunch of options. Um, in my case, 29.91 is not here, so you want to go to custom. And when you type in 29.91, you're going to notice that it rounds up to 30. So it does not like a lot of these uh, fractions. So how do we get around this? Well, this is where the base comes in. So instead of going 29.91 and 1, we're going to represent this as a fraction of integers. So here's what I mean. So instead, we're going to write 2,991 over 100. So imagine you're taking this number and dividing it by that number, and then we kind of retrieve this frame rate that we want. So this is kind of a hack that lets us do what we want uh, to get any fractional frame rate. So now we have 29.91 uh, FPS. Okay, so we want to take this and export it as a image sequence. So to do this, we're going to go to compositing. And then we're going to enable our nodes. We don't need this render layer, so X to delete and then Shift A. And then we're just going to input our movie clip. And we can just find it right here. So we're going to take this movie clip and connect it into our composite. So this is what it's going to output. And we have our in output, we have our resolution correct, our frame rate correct now too. And then we can pick how we want to export this. So I'm going to do a JPEG sequence. Um, we are going to lose a bit of quality because JPEG has uh, quite a bit of compression, but I don't mind this. Um, if you do, again, you have the scene files. You can, of course, change this into a PNG sequence or something more um, lossless with less compression. So JPEG sequence. Click where you want this to save to. I'm going to go desktop and then paper tracking sequence and we're going to put it in here and we're just going to call this sequence. Okay, so that is now good to go, especially and make sure you do set this frame rate. You're going to get some uh, weird issues otherwise that we do not want. Okay, so now that we are all set up, all we have to do is render our animation, I guess. You don't want to render a single frame. So either go to render, render animation or just do control F12. And it's just going to start scrubbing through this and it's going very quickly because again, all it has to do is look at the frame and then save it as an image. So let's see what we have going on here. Yes, it is now populating 
our folder, and it's going to have to do this, I think, 259 times. So I'm just going to skip or fast forward until that is done. Okay, so we just had it finish the last frame. If we go to our folder, you're going to see that we have all 259 frames. And again, this is useful because we no longer have to worry about frame rate, which is an issue when you record with the phone. Okay, so we are done with this. And actually, we're just going to abandon this uh, Blender project right here. So we're just going to go to File, New, File, New, and then General. So now we have a new instance with everything else gone of Blender. And now we can actually get started on this effect. So very first thing you need to do, obviously, is delete everything. We don't want this here. So what we're going to do is we're going to save this project, Control S, and then we are going to save it into our folder, Paper Tracking, and we can call this uh, project paper tracking not too inventive there okay perfect so now let's get started so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go to output and now what this frame rate is representing something different so when we set this frame rate basically this is saying what is it gonna output at whereas before it meant that but it also kind of symbolized how is it gonna read our footage so now we can set this to 30 FPS without any issue so again, this was an issue when we were using movie files, but now we are in image sequences. So we're going to go to the movie clip editor, and this time we are going to import our image sequence. So you're going to get all these images, just click A to select them all, and then open clip, and it will automatically recognize this as an image sequence. Now, first thing that you might notice is that when you scroll through this holding right click, it's super slow, very, very slow. So I'm just going to go back to the first frame, uh, shift left to do that automatically. So what we want to do is speed this up so that we're not going very slowly frame by frame. So first thing I'm going to do, set scene frames. So it's now 259. Then we're going to click prefetch and you're going to see it's going to scroll through here. And basically it's putting all this information in memory, quick access memory. So that now it's scrolling by a lot faster. Okay, perfect. Going to save again. And now we are going to do the first step, which is tracking. Now, again, we are tracking a deformable object, which means at some points it's going to curve in like that. Now, there is no, that's a lot of Ds up there. Uh, there is no way to very easily take a plane and have it track while this plane deforms. So what we're going to be using is a trick of perspective, which works pretty much perfectly when you're looking at it from the right angle. So here's what we're going to do. For each of these markers, we're just going to put a tracker and track it all the way through. So I'm going to be using perspective because I think that's going to be the best for this. Uh, you have some change in perspective as we bend this paper. I'm going to turn on normalize for different lighting conditions. And then right here in correlation, let me just drag this over. In correlation, I'm going to bring this up to 0.9. What this value is, is it's a tolerance. When we're tracking automatically, it's saying, if it's 90% certain that it's correct from frame to frame, keep tracking. If it's not, stop the track. So the lower this is, the more reckless it is, and the closer it is to one, the more um, very, very precise it has to be to continue, is a good way to say it. Okay, so I'm gonna open up track over here. So we're gonna have all this open, and let's begin by doing a single track. And soon we're going to do all of them at once, but let's start with a single one. So control click to do what I just did. So let me just delete that. Uh, control click where you want it. And then we're just going to scale with S. Uh, G, S, and R works here too. And then we can also move it from this window right here, holding shift to do it very slowly. Okay, so once you have that set up, we can uh, track either manually or have it do it automatically. To do it manually, hold alt and then right click like that, and it's going to go frame by frame, just like that. Now, if we do not want to do this 259 times, we can have it do it automatically. And again, it's going to stop once it's not 90% confident that it's correct from frame to frame. So I'm going to click L to center this, or lock it, I guess is what you call it. And then I'm going to click this right here, or you can hit Control T. And it's going to begin tracking. And you see already it ran into an issue. So we're going to go to the frame before this, left click or not left click, left arrow rather. And you see at this point it kind of lost it and it makes sense because there's quite a bit of motion blur. We're gonna see if we can actually help this do it without manually moving it. So I'm just gonna resize this and see if it can handle it now. 
Yep. So sometimes that's really all you need to do. And we can go back and forth, scrub the footage, and you see that it is dead on there. And you, you of course, can look at this window up here. Yeah, so that is perfect. So once we're happy with that, all we need to do is lock it, and we are done. However, we do not want to do this, how many, 20 times? Yeah, we don't want to do this 20 times. So what we're going to do is do them all at the same time. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're just going to put a tracker here and one here. And I'm not scaling them up yet. We're going to do that all at the same time. So these, this is all about bulk processes, processes. I don't know which one it is. And again, these are very, very good uh, tracker markers. They're very high points of contrast. Of course, we do have the issue of motion blur occasionally, and we also have the additional compression from the JPEG sequence. But this is generally kind of what you want. This is the ideal tracker marker. Let's adjust this one. And what I did for this one is I just made this design. Uh, you can quickly find a picture of this tracker uh, on the internet, and then I put them in a grid and then printed it out on a piece of paper. Of course, that might be a bit less convenient if your deformable object is in a sheet of paper. But in my case, it is. Okay. Only a couple more to go. And if anything in this tutorial takes a super long time, like exporting the image sequence, of course, I will fast forward it. But I think this is actually not taking too long, so I don't mind. Okay, one more. Perfect. So now we have all our trackers, but we want to size them up so they consume the entire circle. So we're going to hit A to select all and then S for scale. Now notice that it's scaling exactly how I want it to. Each one is being scaled individually. If that is not happening for you, um, what you want to do is you want to click this button right here. And this is basically saying where do you want it to scale from. So if I instead said 2D cursor, or actually I guess it is working. Either way, you want to make sure it's set to, in this case, it, it doesn't seem to matter that much, but individual origins is what you want. Maybe it's because I didn't define my uh, cursor. I don't know. Either way, that's what you want. I'm just going to scale it perfectly like that. Okay, and now when we have all of them selected and hit this, it's going to track all of them at once. And it's going to be a bit slower because it's doing 20 times the calculations as doing only the corner. And some of these might drop off, like this one dropped off. But hopefully the majority of them make it to the end. And we're just going to go back and retrieve this information over here. Okay. So it looks like all of them made it, except for this one. So what we're going to do is we are going to select this one right here. And then we're just going to scroll back to, let's lock in with L. We're going to scroll back to where it's actually working. Should be the same as last time. There we go. So again, I'm just going to move this and hope that it solves itself, or else we're going to have to move it manually. So something like that. And let's correct that a little too. Okay, let's try tracking it. Okay, it seemed to like that. You won't always get so lucky. Sometimes you have to manually keyframe it. Okay, so now it seems, of course, we can inspect each of these. So if I want to see this one, I can just click it. And now we can see what this one's doing. It seems like all of them are dead on. You do want to make sure of that, but I'm pretty sure that's the case here. So I'm going to select all of them and then right click and then lock tracks. And that locks all of them at once. And now I'm going to save. So what do we have? We have 20 trackers that should be dead on the sheet of paper. And if you don't like these trails, you can always go to display, um, disable path, or make it a shorter path. I'm just going to disable it. So what we want to do now is I'm going to split the view like that and make this a 3D viewport. And what we want is to bring these dots into our 3D viewport. So to do this, we need a camera, first of all. So Shift A, and then we are going to add a camera, which I'm going to hit N to get all of these properties here. I'm just going to center in terms of rotation. So 0, 0, 0. So it's pointing straight down, and then G for grab. Z for up, just put it pretty much facing down like that. Okay, perfect. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select in this window, I'm going to take all these trackers, or you know what, I can just close that up. I'm going to take all of these trackers, and let's turn off lock view, 
I'm going to take all these trackers, go to reconstruction, and then link empty to track. And that should do exactly what we want. Uh, you see our outliner now has a bunch of tracks. So again, select all of them, reconstruction, link empty to track. So now let's bring this back to the 3D viewport. And what do you see? You see our camera and a bunch of lines going down to what looks like a grid of points. And if we play this, indeed, you can kind of see the animation in there. First of all, let's kind of declutter everything. So I'm going to scale these down. Now this is where the individual origins matter. So let's try, let, let, let's uh, see if I'm crazy. So 3D cursor, if I put it over here and now we scale, yeah, that's not what we want, right? So I'm going to, first of all, bring this back to the world origin. So shift S and then uh, cursor to world origin. So I'm going to bring this back to individual origins and then scale it down like that. So that's what I was talking about before. Okay, perfect. So now we have all these points. Now, one thing you might notice is again, uh, we are kind of tracking a three dimensional object. So you'd expect when it's like bending like that, you can see it's kind of bending here. You'd expect it to be three dimensional, but it's actually all in the plane. And this is gonna work whenever we're looking from the perspective of this camera, the illusion works because you have the same perspective. It's basically like advanced corner pinning, but I will kind of describe this a bit more in a second. So let's go to our camera view and in that camera, select your camera, go to settings. I'm going to turn on our background and then make that a movie clip. And of course, open up our sequence and you see we have our background. Let me just turn this off or you know what? We can turn only the axes off you see now our trackers are doing exactly what we expect. Now, again, they're not three dimensional. This is a trick where we're kind of cheating here. We're putting everything all on the same plane, but because we're distorting it in the right way, it's going to end up looking right. So there we go. We have all our trackers there. Now what we want to do is make some geometry. So some kind of rectangle that represents um, this piece of paper that actually deforms. And the way we want it to deform is using this information we have here. So I'm going to select all of these. I'm going to click M and that makes a new collection or we can put them in a new collection in Blender 2.8. New collection and we can call these empties or trackers, whatever you want. How do I spell this? Empties. So now we have this collection here and it's not cluttering everything. So now let's actually make our geometry. So shift A, mesh, and then the obvious thing to do is a plane. And then we just need to resize this. So S for scale, G to move it, R to rotate, and now let's scale it. Uh, so it kind of fits the dimensions of this. Let me turn on our axes again. So scale with respect to X, and then move it. Scale with respect to Y, and then move it. And now let's do a bit of rotation. It doesn't need to be perfect. We'll adjust this in, in just a sec. There we go. So I'm going to say that's pretty good. And now what we want to do is note that we have a grid of 20 uh, trackers. So when we go to edit mode, notice that this is only one polygon. I'm going to hit control R. This is going to add a loop cut. I'm going to scroll up and then select that right click to center. And then same thing on this axis. And basically what we did is for each one of these trackers, there is now a vertex. So for example, there's a vertex here for this tracker right here. So for each tracker, there is now a vertex and we're going to link these things together. So now the geometry is going to move with it. So make sure uh, you add the appropriate number of vertices, depending on what your video clip is. So how do we actually parent everything? Well, there is a very nice way to do this and it's using hooks. So let's uh, start off with this one. So I'm going to select it and we want to move the cursor. So it's here. Um, the shortcut is shift S and then cursor to selected or a fast way to do it is you just go like that. I guess I didn't do it very well, but either way, that's how you do it. Then we're going to open up our plane and select the relevant vertex. And then we want to shift S and then selection to cursor. So the cursor went here and then we move this to the cursor. And now we want to link this vertex to this empty. So control click this. So hold control and then click it. And then control H 
hook to selected object. Okay, what did that do? Let's exit out of edit mode. What did that do? You see it's actually deforming with it and that's kind of the whole idea here. So how many times do we have to do this? We have to do it 19 more times, but let me let me show you a couple more times. You can do it pretty quickly once you get good at it. So I'm going to click this, uh, Shift S, and then cursor to selected. Select this, tab, select your relevant vertex, and then like that, that's the fast way to do it. Control click, Control H, and then hook to selected, and now both of these are moving together. So now let's see how fast we can do this. So double click, boom, bam. <laughs> It really isn't that fast, but I do wonder, I don't really know much about scripting, Python scripting, but I feel like this is the kind of thing you can make a Python script for to do it automatically. Or maybe there's some kind of feature I am not aware of. So I'm just gonna do this a couple more times and then I'll fast forward. Just wanna make sure you under, understand this part. So select the object, Shift S, cursor to selected, and then go into edit mode on your plane, Shift S, selection to cursor. Control click, Control H, hook. And then at speed, looks like this. Okay. And now we have also the interior vertices inside this plane are all parented in the correct way. So I'm just going to continue doing this and fast forward the footage. Okay, so I just finished up the last one. Let's make sure that we actually have all of them. Okay, that is looking very good. Awesome. So I'm just going to save this. And now when we go over to the camera view, what are you going to see? Well, let's actually bring this to the beginning and then play it. That's exactly what we want. Look at that. So now we have this plane kind of tracked, and again, it's deforming correctly, even though it's not three-dimensional. When you look at it from just the right angle, and that's the whole idea here. When you look at it from just the right angle, everything works out. And we have this kind of system of parenting where if we select our camera and rotate it, it's kind of attached. And then if we play it, it all works out. Okay, so make sure all your vertices are set. And now one thing we want to deal with is, you see, since we don't have that many points, um, everything considered, let me turn this off. Since we don't have that many points, everything kind of looks sharp. You can kind of see the, these uh, edges, the outline. Well, how do we deal with this? Well, there's many techniques, but the idea is we want to smooth this out, but still have it animate correctly. And there's a couple ways to do this. I'll show you the best one. So select your plane, which I'm just going to rename. I'm going to rename it paper, and then I'm going to rename our camera projector because it's projecting the location of these points or something like that. So we're going to go to our paper. We're going to go to modifiers and you're going to see all these um, tracker modifiers and that's basically these hooks, um, 20 of them to be precise. So we're going to scroll to the bottom or actually to the top. We are going to add. Now your first instinct might be a subdivision surface. I'll show you what happens when you do that. So let's scroll to the bottom. You're going to bump this up and you're going to see that, you know, it's smoothing and it's even tracking on. However, it kind of warped our corners. And if you don't want that to happen, you might go to simple, but then it doesn't smooth out everything else. So subsurf is not really the way to go unless you stack two of them. And same thing with multi-resolution uh, modifier. So the best way to go, I found, and this doesn't mess with the UVs either, which is going to be important is we are going to add a bevel modifier. I know, I know, very useful. So let's zoom in. We're gonna take this width, bring it all the way up, and you already see it smoothing, and then we just add segments, something like four. And now it's a lot smoother. Let's pick the part where I bend the paper. Look at that. So that's uh, without, and that's with, much smoother. We can actually bring this up to five if we want. Okay, and we don't even need to apply this. We can just keep it in the stack for now. Okay, amazing. Well, now let's actually put some kind of texture on here. And this is, I kind of think of this as the Harry Potter, um, the Harry Potter newspaper effect. You know, they have these uh, newspapers with video on them. Uh, we can put anything on this, including video. So let's go to shading. Okay, once we're in shading, we're gonna select our, our paper. 
we're going to add a new material. We don't need any of this junk. And then in this folder, let me close this up for a second. In our folder, I have this file right here. It's going to be available in the project files again, download link, link to download. You can download it in the description. So I'm going to take this and just copy it into here. So that's our UV grid. What are we going to do with it? We're, we're going to shift A. I just did shift S. That's my bad. We're going to shift A and then texture, image texture. We're going to hook this up to the surface. And then of course our image texture is going to be this UV grid. Okay. And you see that's applied. Let's go to layout and bring this to uh, rendered mode. So you see that this is actually deforming and it kind of looks three dimensional. Of course, it will really look correct when we go to the right angle. But when you look at it from the side, you can kind of see what it is we're doing. It's this kind of advanced corner pinning is probably the best way to think about it. So instead of just pinning the four corners, we're pinning many spots of the plane. And now let's go to our camera view and that's distorting correctly. Look at that, it's not even moving, it's also bending. Well, what's the drawback here? There is a drawback. Because this is two dimensional, during this spot in the footage where we're bending it kind of like that, that's a lot of Ds. I, I wonder if I can fix that. Um, let me erase that. So many Ds. Um, either way, uh, when it's bending this much, we expect it to kind of cast a shadow on itself because it's kind of in a giant uh, parabola parabolic cylinder to be precise but because it's two-dimensional we can't actually cast that shadow that's a drawback but you know what we can live with it okay so you're, you're probably screaming at me uh, this is not big enough you can see the boundaries and the issue is if we take our paper and try to scale it with us nothing happens and that's because it's hooked by a bunch of spots so it's kind of constrained and can't move okay well how do we scale it then well think about it I mean we are in this camera view and it works from this camera angle. What if we took this camera, duplicated it, shift D, right click to bring it back, and then just G, Z, move it down. Well, what would that look like? Well, let's take this camera, call it our viewer, because that's the camera we're gonna view from. And notice right now, it's just going back to the same camera. Uh, to make this the camera we go to, you go to view, cameras, set active object as camera. And now you see it's much bigger. So if we hit N, which lets us control this, you can see exactly what's happening. Let me split the view so we get a side by side like that. Um, so in this one, uh, let me just go into this view and we'll see what's, what happens when we go up and down. So the camera is moving up and down and that's effectively scaling this paper because we're going closer to the source. So let's close that out. So we want to bring this as, we want to make this as close to the boundary, but not go too big. So something like that, because if we make it too big, it's going to begin cutting into my hand. It's going to look really weird. Okay. So that, let's see if that's right. See if it pokes out at any point. Yeah. It's kind of poking out a little bit. So let's do that. And no matter what you do, it's still going to keep the right perspective. Now you see right here that there's a bit of um, exposure over here. Um, so here you want to choose. Do you want to zoom this in even further? Do you want to paint this out? Or do you just want to live with it? In this case, we're going to live with it. But just know that you do have options. So this is pretty good. Oh, and by the way, why does this um, already map correctly? Like, why did it work automatically? Well, the reason is because we're using a plane object. I mean, we are deforming it. But because we're using a plane object, if you go to UV editing, and select all your faces. It's just a perfect square. And the image we imported, this one, is a perfect square. So that's why it works out. So anything you wanna bring in here, um, you wanna make sure it's a square or rectangular at least, and it's gonna work out. Um, let's close out of this. Actually, no, what am I doing? Oh, well, we don't need this anymore. Let's just abandon that. Okay, so now we have this shaded. So let's go back into here and it's working out. Okay, so clearly what is the issue here now? Well, it's overlapping my thumbs. It's not supposed to do that. The thumb is supposed to be over the piece of paper. So in some sense, we want three layers. We want this background, then we want this uh, CG paper, 
and then we want a layer here and here for my thumbs. And the way to do this is to mask out my thumbs. And if you have never done masking, buckle up. This is not the fun part. This really is not the fun part. So let's draw some masks. So go into Movie Clip Editor. Again, this is where you track and draw masks. So you just go to Mask. And now we are in masking mode. Um, these trackers are still here. If you want to hide them, just click Pattern. And it's going to hide them. So now what we need to do is to draw a mask that goes over this part of my thumb and then later on in the footage, this kind of meaty part of my thumb, I guess you could call it, because again, the paper is a bit bigger than this paper, so it's going to cut in even more. So we need to mask that there for all the frames and here for all the frames. And you might think that pulling a luma key would be okay because this is white, but you know, my hand, I'm a pretty white dude, so it would work okay. It would work better if my skin color wasn't as white. So I'm not going to pull a Luma key on this one. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, what we want to do is draw some masks. So now we are in mask uh, mode up here. To start drawing a mask, all you do is, again, it depends on if you have your settings for left or right click. I believe mine's on right click. So you hold control and right click. And that's going to add a point. You click it again here and drag, it's going to define a spline. So you just kind of keep control clicking and draw around. At any point you could take this and hit G to move it, or that's moving the arm. You could, or hold the right click here and then click G, that works too. And then you can just keep control clicking and it's just going to continue your spline where you left off. Now I'm pretty sure we can bring this into black and white mode. Yeah, if it's easier to see what you're doing, you can go to black and white mode. It's more, uh, I wouldn't say it's more contrasty, but it's easier for the human eye to see what's going on. So I'm just going to draw kind of like a, nothing special, kind of easy mask. And then we're just going to close this off like this. And then you don't go back and click this here to make this a, a closed shape. Uh, you go to mask and then you hit cyclic. And that's automatically going to seal it, although it's going to make this uh, closing and starting point very sharp. So right click it to select this point and then click V, I believe. Yeah, V and then change this, the handle type to aligned, um, just to aligned like that. And then we can scale this up and down, rotate it exactly what you'd expect. So let's adjust this. Rotate this one. Same controls as pretty much everywhere else. Now this is our new mask, right? We just defined a mask. We can rename it into left, uh, left thumb. So this is our left thumb mask. And again, like I said, we also need the meaty part of the thumb, but not for the, um, not for the whole footage. Like right now we don't need the meaty part of the thumb. It's not overlapping, but around here we need to start uh, masking it. So in our mask, we can have multiple parts. So this is the first part right here. We can call it the tip, as in the tip of the thumb. And then later on, we can click here to add another part. So how do we do this? Well, we have this uh, display right here, and we have this one here, which we are going to change into a dope, dope sheet. One of my favorite things. Bring that into mask, and now you see our left thumb is in here. So at any point to keyframe, you just hit I and it's going to add a keyframe. So if we go seven frames in, all we have to do is select all of them. G is going to grab them, maybe a bit of rotate. Oh, that's not rotating the correct way. And that's because we changed this from individual origins uh, to median point. That would work. So we've been doing a lot of this uh, pivot point changing. So you do this and then you just right click to adjust. And generally, the most efficient way to do this is to move the shape all together and then just make your fine adjustments. And we can also track like the fingernail. We can make another track. So not like the tracks we did here, but a track for the thumb and then connect the mask onto that. Although I have not been getting very good results with that. So I'm not going to do it. So once you're happy with this, just click I and it's going to keyframe. And now if we go back and forth, it's not perfect because we need to put some keyframes in between, but you see it's traveling with it at least. And then one other thing, uh, probably because of my weird 29.91 
uh, frames per second issue. The first frame and the second frame are identical, which is not like not a big issue, but it is a teachable moment because what I can do is just zoom in here by holding that. So I want this frame and this frame to be the same. So I just take my keyframes, these ones, and shift D to duplicate and just move them down like that. And that way it sticks on and then it starts moving. So I'm gonna go to the frame in between uh, inside this gap. Then we're just gonna adjust this. And you can be very accurate with this. It really depends on what you're going for. I'm not gonna be crazy about this and then I and then there you go. This part is pretty well um, animated. And we're just gonna do a bit more. Um, as you can imagine, this is gonna take a good while. So I'm not gonna do all of it. I already have the masks uh, pre-prepared, which I'm gonna import. Again, that's gonna be in the scene file, so you don't need to mask it either if you don't want. But just uh, for example, we'll just do a bit more. Um, okay, so we can go a couple more frames down move this, hit I, make sure you hit I, or just do automatic keyframes if you don't want to hit I every time, and maybe adjust it in the gaps in between. It, I mean, the thumb isn't that bad. You could have a much worse shape. And then once you do this, if it's not a perfect mask, then you can pull a Luma key, and that's going to get rid of the border, at least in this uh, white area. And then let's say we also want to track the meaty part of the thumb. Of course, we do not. Uh, want to do this at this part of the footage, but let's say we did. What we do is click add, and this is a second area in our mask, and we're going to call this base, as in, you know, the base of the thumb. So we're just going to hide, or we're going to hide that, and then just control right click to define this shape. Zoom in here. And the first shape, the first shape ended about here, so we're just going to have a bit of overlap just to be safe. And then we can just kind of round it off here, turn this to cyclic, right click our uh, ceiling point, V aligned. There we go. And now these, or this rather, hasn't been keyframed yet. We've only keyframed the tip, not the base. So when we open this up, you see the base doesn't have any keyframes. So I'm just gonna add a keyframe. And then go down here. We can, oh, remember the first or the second frame is a duplicate. So we just select this, Shift D, put that there. Perfect. And now we animate it with it like that. And we can actually have both of them enabled at the same time to see what's going on. And you see it's moving together. If you want to make sure that your mask is looking good, uh, you can always go to Mask Display, Overlay, that gives you this, or change this to Combine, and then you're going to see what you've masked off. Just like that. Okay, let's turn that off. And then, of course, you're going to need to do this with the second thumb. Um, you could do this all in one mask, but I prefer to have two masks. Um, not that important for this tutorial, but in other cases, it's pretty important. So you go to um, this mask area over here, and then click Add a New Mask. So now we have our mask and left thumb. So we rename this Right Thumb. And then we do the same procedure here. And you need to do this for how long? For 259 frames. Screw that. Uh, let's import the masks that I made before. So I'm just going to take these masks and delete them. I guess if you want to truly delete them, uh, pro tip, go into Blender file. This is where all your things are, including your masks. So you just select whatever you want. Right click, or maybe do you just click a delete? Do you click X? Why can't I delete them? Well, it seems like for some reason I cannot get rid of my mask. Uh, save this data block even if it has no users. Unlink data block. You know what? Quite honestly, I don't know what's happening right now. But that's fine. So let, whatever. Maybe I'm missing something stupid. Not a big deal. So we're just going to call this 1 just to not get confused. And 2. 
And now we are going to import our masks. So let's do this. We're, we are going to file, append, and then we have, where did I save it? Is in the desktop? Yeah. So I have this file called tracking masks. And then when you click that, you have all this stuff, including the masks. And we're just going to bring this and this in, which is why I renamed it to one and two. So we wouldn't be confused. There we go. So now when we go to masks, we have all of this. So we have this mask right here. Let me just show it off. So by the way, this block right here, that's the base of the thumb. I didn't animate it in this portion because it's not important. It's disabled too. If you go to overlay, you see it's it doesn't actually count. I did that by animating the opacity of the base. So once you get into like here, this area, you see the opacity has gone back up to one and it's tracking on nicely. Just like that. And then we have the same kind of deal over here. Let me enable this so we see everything. Okay, so now we have our masks. So now we are in the home stretch, which is putting everything together. Okay, so how do we put everything together? Let's go back to 3D viewport. So again, we want background, a piece of paper, and then thumbs. So how are we going to do this? Well, first of all, let's render Let's render one frame of this. So we, we can do this in Eevee, doesn't really matter. If we are in Eevee, go to Film, Alpha, and go to Transparency. This is going to render it so that I'm pretty sure that should make the background uh, null, but we'll see about that. Let's see, what do we have in our compositor? Yeah, pretty much nothing. So let's hit F12, and it's just going to render this one frame, which is exactly what we want. So when we go into Compositor, when we go into Compositor, everything's here, although you don't see it, and that's because you need to add a viewer node. Now you can do this two ways, Shift A, Output, uh, Viewer, that should do it, or the fancy way. And for this, you need Node Wrangler, so just go to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, Node Wrangler, and enable that. You can just control shift, click, uh, whatever you want to see. So control shift, click. And now we have our viewer automatically made. I'm going to hit uh, V. Yeah, V to zoom out. And then alt, hold, uh, middle mouse to move this. Okay, so we have our middle layer. We need the background. So shift A, input, uh, movie clip. And this is going to be our background and then we just choose the sequence. So how do we put this layer over the background? Well, there's a bunch of ways. The best way, at least I think one of the best ways for this, Shift A, Color, Alpha Over. So I'm gonna put this in the background, this in the foreground, and then we need a alpha, which comes from here to blend this. Okay, and then Control Shift click to view it, perfect. Now, if we get rid of this factor, or I guess it does work. Okay, either way, I'm just going to keep that there. Okay, so now we have this and this, but we want the thumbs to go over it. So we're going to need our mask. So Shift A, and then Input, and then Mask. So we are going to have our thumb left, Shift D to duplicate, our thumb right, thumb left, thumb right. Okay. And then we want to make this into one big mask that we apply to this and put it over. Well, what do I mean by this? Well, we're just going to duplicate this, put it here. So this is going to be the background. And then in the foreground, we have our thumbs. So we put this here. Now, of course, we don't want all of this, just the thumbs, which is where these masks come into play. So if we control shift this, you see this thumb and then this thumb to combine them, uh, shift A, and then we're going to do a math operation. So vector, no, converter, and then put math right here. And we're just going to add these two, which does exactly what you think it would. It adds both of them. So now if we put this here as our factor, you see the thumbs are now over it. 
It's trying to do something a little fancy there. Um, our thumbs are over it. And that's going to be true for every frame. Although we didn't render every frame of the middle layer, so we're not going to deal with that yet. So why does this look so weird? Uh, it's because V to zoom in, or no, Alt V to zoom in. It's because we don't have any shadows, and this is pretty sharp. So how do we take care of that? Well, first of all, let's handle the shadows. So to make shadows, to make shadows, I'm going to put this under our thumbs, right? So you have background, picture, shadows, thumbs. So we need to put the shadow in between here and here. So I'm going to add shift A, A, a mix should do it. So for one of the layers, we're going to have this. And then for the other layer, we are going to have black, which is going to represent shadow. But we don't want the shadow everywhere. We just want it under the thumbs. Now you might think the way to do that is to bring this mask into here but then our shadow is directly under the thumb, so you're not going to see it. Okay, well, how do we move it? Well, you can just add a transform, put that in here, and then bring this down, or I guess up is what I'm doing currently. And then you see that our shadow is under here. So let's move it so it's below the thumb like that. Okay, perfect. So, couple issues. One, looks horrible, but two, there's shadow where there isn't even paper. So let's take care of that. So how do we take care of that? So basically, we only want shadow um, where it's um, from under the thumb and where the plane is. So that's an intersection. Or in other words, it's a multiplication operation. Okay, so what we need to do is Shift D, duplicate change this to multiply. I'm going to wedge this in right here. So we're going to multiply this transform by, well, how do we know where there is plane? Well, that's exactly the alpha, the alpha of the plane. There we go. And now it's only in this area. So you see this is before, and then we cut this off after. Perfect. Um, now let's make it look less ugly. So before we multiply it, let's blur it out a little. So shift A, blur, wedge that in right there, and then blur it until it kind of looks like a shadow. So maybe 12 in both directions, something like that. Keep zooming in. And then we also want to soften these shadows, uh, which we can do by before we bring this in here, Shift D, add another multiply. And in this case, we took it and multiplied it by 0.5, so it's half as strong. So 1, unaffected, 0, invisible, 0.5, halfway in between. So let's do 0.65. So now we have a softer shadow. OK, I like the way that looks. Let's save. OK, so now another issue to deal with is that the thumbs themselves, not the shadow, but the thumbs look a bit choppy. So how do we deal with this? Well, when we put the thumbs in, we just use this addition here, this addition. What we want to do is soften that addition. Well, how do we do that? Well, that's just a simple, that's just a simple blur. So shift A, sorry, shift A, blur, add that in right there. And then you want to be very, very careful with this. You really do not want to overdo this. So we're going to zoom in. OK, so let's try starting off with something like 3 in both directions. And that's already looking a bit too blurred out. So let's go back to 2. And you're also going to notice that you see maybe in some of these frames a tiny bit of white around here. So if you want to get rid of that, before we blur it, we can kind of close this mask in a little and that's called a dilation or a contraction and so shift a add a dilation or a dilate and let's see what this does well when we move this up it expands it and then when we move it down it uh, subtracts it so look at this and then this and then we are going to blur it and then that's going to go in here 
and you can make this a bit more extreme you can go to minus two and you see it kind of chops in the thumb a little but I'm just gonna stay at minus one and that these kind of uh, small touches really help really help sell the effect okay next this uh, render layer is looking way too colorful at least in this case uh, if we put something different that wasn't this image that might not be the case oh by the way I didn't even mention this um, well I did mention it but we didn't even talk about it you don't need this picture you can make it you know anything you can put anything on this plane for example you can put let's see how do we change this quickly okay what if we go into shading go into this and change it from UV grid into into well, let's move this into image sequence and then which image sequence I guess we need to import it this sequence right here well then it's gonna have the video of me holding the video of course we need to F12 to update that and now it's me holding me holding the thing and we can have this be a nested kind of shebang but let's go back I wonder if undo yeah there we go um, compositing F12 to refresh yeah so again you can put anything in here it can be a video it really doesn't matter so we're gonna take this we're gonna desaturate it so shift a actually I don't know what it's called so shift a color what's it called hue saturation value I'm gonna wedge that in here and then we can dip the saturation and you see what that does make it a bit darker anything that you feel like will blend it in more change the color of it I think I did that for the preview of this uh, tutorial there we go and that is looking like a composite so let's try a different frame let's try like one of the frames where it's really bent I'm gonna move this to nonlinear so let's pick a frame like that right there lots of distortion well we go into compositing f12 to render 128 and now we have that frame and you see these nodes kind of work for any frame because now now our masks look like this because we are on this frame dilation blur everything works out the shadows are these shadows are underneath and then we get that and you want to make sure that your mask works for every frame I already did that for you so again use the project file use these masks so now I believe let me think I'm trying to think if we forgot anything we could we could add a little something extra I think that compared to everything else this is looking a bit sharp looking like I just kind of downloaded a picture from somewhere which I did uh, so what I'm gonna do this is really a mess but the logic is there so that's what's important so uh, we changed the color saturation value now let's add a bit of blur so shift a and then what am I looking for I'm looking for a blur nice little blur a very soft one maybe one by one and to see what that did let's actually zoom in I keep zooming out I don't know what's wrong with me okay let's try two no that's a bit too much let's go back to one okay so I think that I'm actually happy with this so to render you know more than just a single image I'm gonna go to layout uh, in output uh, let's do PNG output no compression and then let's save these directly into our directly into or you, mm, let's make actually a tiny video we don't need to make a, a sequence so 30 frames per second let's output it as a FF meg FF MPEG video um, okay encoding we want this to be h264 mp4 type thing so mpeg4 h264 medium quality doesn't really matter let's only do like 
one second of it, so 30 frames, but it should work for all of these. So we're restricting it to 30 frames. Okay, no audio, all this is fine. Output it, output it in our folder. Tutorial uh, output, amazing. And before we output this, one final remark. Again, this perspective idea, which I, again, I keep stressing that it's really powerful. As long as your camera is from the right angle, and even if you move it down along the same angle, this really does work. It really does. So even if your camera is moving in the shot, like for example, in this shot, in this shot, it's very not noticeable. But if you look at the edge of the frame, the camera does move. So technically this is a moving shot. So these ideas were this corner pinning works with a moving camera. That's why it's so powerful. Enough of that. Um, output 30 frames and then, okay, I think we're good. We'll see about that though. So control F12, and that's gonna render the animation. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Big issue, big issue. Uh, you saw in the composite, it didn't have any of the background, even though we have all this. But that's because we've been feeding all of this, all of these nodes into the viewer. We need to also, also feed them into the composite. And that's basically what it's going to output. So now when we hit Control F12, I have higher hopes. There we go. So it renders, updates, renders, updates. It's implying our color change, our bringing the thumbs back. So while this renders for only 30 frames, some critiques, uh, the shadows could be softer and put in a better place. Um, definitely some color correction that needs to happen here. I would recommend, I made the piece of paper a bit too big, but if we didn't, we would need to paint out the first one, which is a pain, so I guess that's fine. But if you can help it, scaling down this paper is always gonna help sell the effect. Okay, so that's our 30 frames. Let's save our project. Uh, where did I save this? This folder. Now, hopefully this plays nicely. Let's try opening it. Yeah, there we go. So it's only a second long, but it really is correct. Um, you'll notice that there's a few issues like right here. The mask seems to be a bit off. That could either be a dilation issue or maybe the mask was just a bit off, you know? But that can always be fixed. That's my challenge to you to fix it. And there we go. Well, what did we talk about? We talked about turning things into image sequences, how to do, how to do uh, tracking. We learned a lot about tracking and how to do this corner pin effect, especially how to use um, this kind of corner pinning uh, hooks onto empties idea and then using a bevel to smooth it out. Uh, we talked about uh, shading this, about masking the thumbs over, and then finally this mess, which really isn't that complicated. Hopefully it was easy to follow. Uh, this uh, node network, which kind of composites, composites it all together along every single frame. Of course, it kind of breaks since we didn't uh, update this. If we F12, that should update. Yeah, now everything looks correct. But hopefully this tutorial was very useful. Again, I have not seen anything like this on the internet, uh, at least when it comes to tracking deformable objects. Oh no, I don't know if you saw what I just saw. That means we needed to make the plane a bit bigger. You see, it's kind of poking out. Either way, um, in my uh, preview, I made sure it was the right size. But that is how you make this uh, deformation tracking effect. And it works with more than just paper. Only downside is you kind of miss out on shadows and stuff like that. So hopefully you really enjoyed this tutorial. I, I really had fun making this one. Thank you guys for watching. Um, if you want to support me, either, you know, keep watching the tutorials. I also have a Patreon, but make sure you download uh, the resources for free. Of course, the uh, project files below. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys on the next one.